Hi, welcome to the Women's Health Podcast. I'm Anthony Lowe, the Physio Detective. And I'm Marika Hart from Herosphere. Together we interview leading authorities, we answer questions and share our thoughts to provide the general public with the best quality information that we can find on all aspects of women's health. Please remember that the materials and the content on this podcast are intended as general information and they're for entertainment purposes only. They're not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Now sit back, grab your favourite beverage, or do your thing, and enjoy the show. Hey everybody, welcome back. It's great to be with you, and I'm with my co-host here, Marika. How are you going, Marika? Good morning, Anthony. I am. Uh, I'm a little bit tired, to be honest, but I will. I've got my coffee. I'm going to snap into it very soon because awesome. <laughs> I'm excited about. I'm excited about our special guest. Our special guest is Anemisa. Um, Anemisa, we have met in real life. I'm proudly wearing your shirt. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, and we met in Edmonton on a course, the Optimizing the Athlete course. And um, it was great to meet you in real life. And love, we, we love what you do on social media around diastasis and body image. And um, it's been a pleasure, you know, counting you as one of my friends and um, it's great to hear you today uh, give uh, give us your information and your wisdom through the whole of your life really so I'm really excited to hear more about it but did you want to start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, hi Anthony um, thanks for having me on thanks for having me on Marika um, I'm in Amazon, I'm 34, I'm a mum of three, I have a seven-year-old, nine-year-old and two-year-old sons um, and I live in northern Canada, I live in Yellowknife, it's the only Canadian city I've ever lived in so I really have nothing else to compare it to but that's my Canadian experience. I moved um, to Yellowknife from England and I've li lived in England my whole adult life, before that I lived in Nigeria. So, Nemeset, you met through Anthony through his course. Are you um, a fitness professional? Is that your is Yeah, that your job? I'm a fitness professional. So, I kind of through what brought me into fitness was my own personal journey with diastasis. And Anthony was a voice online that was talking about it. I followed um, someone else, Lisa Marie Ryan, and she talked about this physio that she was working with. So, I started following him. And then I saw he did talk courses all over the world. But I live in a remote area and it's expensive to travel. So... I looked at um, the female athlete and I saw there was an online version. So I completed that and I was talking to other people that had done that and they recommended that if I had a chance to go to a live course to do it. And it just happened in within a month of me completing the female athlete, um, I saw that uh, Anthony was going to be in the Duke teaching a course called Optimizing the Athlete. So I was like, okay, <laughs> this is my chance. And so that's when we met last year. I love how we've got this cameo going on in the background. Is that your son? Oh, my son, my seven-year-old Nate. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anderson, tell us about because you you specialize working with new mums, right? Um, I do. Uh, so that's kind of it's just in my own passion for my own personal experience because what brought me into fitness was my own journey as a postpartum woman. Before my second child, I didn't exercise. I wasn't interested in going to the gym. My whole life, the marketing that I'd seen around fitness was weight loss. And I've always been like naturally slim. So I thought, well, I'm skinny. I don't need to lose weight. I don't need to exercise. And I was fine with that. Um, after my second child, I had that typical bounce back. My body went back after like a year and I was fine. It was after my second child that everything just felt different. And then I started having all these aches and pains I didn't have before. My back hurt. I found that I leaked and I just didn't like how my body looked. And then... Then I started noticing like the marketing, it was like the snapback, the lose weight. And I initially thought, okay, this is a weight loss thing. I need to lose the baby weight. And so my weight at that time stood at always around 110 pounds. I was five foot seven, 110 pounds. And I thought I need to lose weight. So I went on a diet. I dropped to 90 pounds. I was five foot seven and 90 pounds, but my stomach still stuck out. And it was that point I thought, well, maybe this isn't a weight loss issue. So I wanted to dig a little bit deeper. So I started joining fitness groups and doing all the mummy snapback challenges and posting my pictures. And it was when I was in a fitness group and there was a plank challenge and I did the plank and I took a picture and I was talking within 
sorry, just a group chat with four other girls. And I sent the picture. I said, does your belly look like this when you plank? And they all said no. So I was like, oh. So then I went into a group and I posted the picture. I said, does anyone else's belly look like this when they plank? And someone commented, do you have a diastasis recti? And that was the first time I ever heard that word. So I went into Google, copied, pasted the phrase into Google and hit search. And then all these bellies that look just like my belly came up. And then it, that was the time I thought, oh, okay, this is something different. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tough thing when you hit Google and find all those things because it's always a lottery of what you're going to get. Um, tell us more about that diastasis journey and, um, you know, the, the body image side of things, how you, you know, how you felt from that point, um, finding out that you had diastasis, how did that make you feel? And I, um, so I searched it and then I wanted to find out all the information I could about it. <laughs> the other one. All the information I could about it. And then you start seeing the list. Like it means you can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. And then there's all those self-confirming prophecies. I had, I was struggling because I had back pain. <laughs> um, <laughs> I. All good. All good. All good. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was had back pain and the information said a diastasis gives you back pain. So I was like, oh, this is why I was having incontinence, which was something new. And it says the diastasis gives incontinence. So it was like, this is why. But then at the same time, it was frustrating because it was another label. And there was something inside me that just wanted to rebel against that. And it kind of also came from my whole life. I felt like I'd always been stuck in a box like other. Everyone else can exercise like this, but you can't. You're other. I was... I, I moved to England when I was five, so I was a fi I didn't speak English. I was straight out of Nigeria, put in an English school in the city I lived in. It was a predominantly, <laughs> it was a predominantly um, white city. It was dubbed at the time England's last white city. I was the only black child in the school. My hair was different. My skin was different. My, I spoke differently. I didn't speak English when I went there, and I also had these hernias. I was born with two abdominal hernias, an umbilical hernia and a para-umbilical hernia, which just means it's a hernia that sits above an umbilical hernia. And so my belly button protruded and I got bullied for that. So I've just kind of came from a situation where I've lived my life trying to fight just being different and just not fitting in. And so it was another defining label that I didn't want to associate with. So initially when I read it, I thought, no, I'm not gonna pay any attention to this. I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. Look at all the ab exercises I can do. So I started doing this, doing the ab challenges, did 50 sit-ups and you look in the mirror and you're like, do I have abs yet? And it doesn't work. And then look the next day, do I have abs yet? And I, I became frustrated. So due to my frustration, it was like, that was, I thought, what else could I do? And I saw my doctor and he said, I said, I've been reading online that I have this and it's leading to all this stuff. And he told me, well, there's nothing you can really do. He's like, we can have surgery. But he said, I wouldn't recommend you have surgery until you're done having kids. And I knew that I wanted to have three kids and I just had two. So I was like, okay. But then I thought, do I have to just like live and be miserable in my body till I have kids? Do I have to like live with this pain? And so that was kind of what brought me into exercise. It was also, do I have any other options? But then the idea of surgery, it was hard for me to swallow because I have a history with surgery. And this is why for me, a person's story is so important. And there's a lot of people that will push surgery for diastasis. And the thing is, like for me, there's that idea of abdominal surgery holds a lot of trauma. And it's not a route I wanted to go down, not because I thought it was right or wrong, but because I have memories of it that are traumatic for me. Um, like when I was, I moved to England, I was born with my hernias, but I didn't even realize like it was a thing. I kind of had to, I was taught that it was something that I should be bothered about. And when I looked at the stats as an adult, it said up to 30% of children of African descent are born with umbilical hernias. I remember as a child, my younger sister had one, my cousin had one. It was just, it wasn't anything. Then I went to England as a five-year-old and I was so different and kids have no filters. So <laughs> they just point out like you're different from them. And I would undress for physical education and they'd point it out and it was different and it was funny and they laughed at me. So that I suddenly, I became very self-conscious about it. 
And as an adult, I've asked my mom, like, why did you let me have surgery as a six-year-old? And she said she, said she felt she had no choice because she said I became so self-conscious that I would refuse to take my clothes off in front of anyone, even in front of her. And she said, when your six-year-old daughter won't undress in front of you because she's so worried about how she looks, she thought that if I have surgery, it will fix all my body image issues. And so I had the surgery and that in itself was, there were a lot of things that I didn't understand what was happening. It was never explained to me. There was a language barrier with the staff at the hospital. So I had like a bad experience with the hospital staff. My dad's a doctor and he's a Nigerian doctor. He's a gynecologist, not a surgeon. But um, in the Nigerian culture, the, it's like the man is, knows everything and he's the top of the family. And my dad's also a doctor. So although he allowed another surgeon to operate on me, that was as far as he wanted it to go. So he, all my aftercare was done at home. And my mom also had the trauma of having her child go under general anesthetic and all the risks associated. She didn't want me to be put under again. So I just remember like the bandages being changed at home. Every time the air touched it, how painful it was. I remember my stitches being pulled out and my parents wouldn't agree for me to have anesthetic, anesthesia. So it was pulled out like, and I was with no painkillers. So I remember like how it felt when it was pulled from my skin. I remember that the operation didn't even work. I didn't understand what had happened. I remember like within a year, the hernias were back. And so now I had the two hernias. I had this weird scar across my belly button. I had no belly button because of the way the surgery had done. And it just, in my mind, it made everything worse. And so even when I talk about body image, the idea of if you don't like it, fix it. I'm like, but you don't really, if you don't understand what you're trying to fix. And I'm not even sure the doctor understood what he was trying to fix because he was operating on a black child in a condition he wasn't familiar with in a city that was 99% white. And so, and even in hindsight, my mom tells me my grandmother was angry at her when she heard about the surgery. And she said, you should have just left her alone because this happens to so many, like in her village, she said, this happens to so many village children. And oftentimes it reduces by the time, like they're an adult. And so there were all these things. And so when I think about surgery, there are all these things like you have to, I didn't, I never understood the surgery that played into a lot of my body image issues because I grew up knowing, not understanding what the hernias was, understanding that I'd had a surgery that didn't work, understanding that women carry children in their stomachs, but I didn't know what was um, happening to had happened to my stomach. So another underlying layer of it was I always had this fear that maybe I couldn't carry children because I'm like, there's so many things going on with my stomach and I don't know what all these mean, all this means. And so all of that kind of ties on to when the idea of surgery was being forced on me all the time. The reason I was so resistant and I was like, there needs to be another way. And then I write about it and I get the response to people from some people sometimes like, you're like so brave or how can, um, I wish I had the patience to stick with exercise and not do surgery. I'm like, it's not about bravery or patience. If anything, it was about fear. Like it was such a negative experience. I thought anything has to be better than doing that again. Oh, sorry, we're both muted there. Yeah, that's <laughs> such, that's such an interesting story. So the the sort of scars of the mental scars and the physical scars of that from such a young age, you know, they just carry through, don't they? And it's just I can imagine that for you, that thought of going back in, and especially in the same region, like in the same area. Um, yeah, and just like this fear like of my body, I think that ties into like why. I want to know and I, why I like to talk to people and educate them because I feel like when you don't understand and I didn't understand what happened and when I didn't understand their hernias, I was afraid of them. But when I understood them, I was like, okay, this is how I can manage them. When I didn't understand, like, just, it's not even just the condition. It's just me not knowing what was going on with my body. And just all I wanted was answers my whole life. And so now I feel like the need to give some other people answers. Did you? Um, did you feel that as you're going sort of through your teenage years and your early 20s, so you said there was that underlying fear of um, maybe not even being able to hold, like carry a baby. Did you have fear of exercise? Like, did you worry that you might do wrong things or that you shouldn't be able to lift anything? Like did the, um, the fact that the hernia operations not, the fact they weren't successful for you, um, did that mean that you felt also from a functional point of view that may, that your body wasn't strong or do you feel like you did manage to do all the things that you wanted to do? Well, I had no concept of even the idea of pressure management or even what a hernia was. And I didn't even, the, 
I just knew I had weird lumps on my belly. The word hernia wasn't said to me till like after my second pregnancy when I was asking my doctor about my diastasis and he was feeling me and he said, well, this, this isn't a diastasis, this is a hernia. And I was like, okay, what's a hernia? And that was the first time I'd even heard that. And I was like, I've lived with this for 27 years and this is the first time somebody's like explaining this to me that this is what it is. And he, that's when he said, well, a hernia is a hole in the fascia. It's like yours is very large. Things can, it means organs can slip in and out of it. That's why it protrudes. They said the risk with hernia is entrapment. With a small hernia, it has a risk of the organs getting trapped and losing blood supply, which can be dangerous. But for yours, it's so large that your organs just kind of all fat or tissue, whatever, just kind of goes in and out of it and nothing gets trapped. So he says it's really just, says there's, it's, he told me it wasn't dangerous, that it's really just an aesthetic thing. If you don't like how it looks, I'll operate on it, was the response I got when I talked to the surgeon about it. So I thought, okay, then. <laughs> um, then I remember him throwing out a comment. I said, is there any exercises I should not do? Because at the time, when I, after I'd approached him, I'd been exercising for a year and people online had been telling me that I shouldn't be doing what I was doing. So I said, should I not be weightlifting? And he said, oh, the only thing I wouldn't recommend is maybe upside down crunches. <laughs> and so it was just a random like, thing that was thrown out. It's always stuck in my head. I'm like, I hope I could do, I want to try and do upside down crunches one day. <laughs> but with a diastasis, um, when I found out what it was, I started, I'm like, okay, let me do exercise. And it's something that I'd never done. So it's funny when people say I hate exercising. So I'm like, well, I hated it too, <laughs> but it was something different. And so the reason I started posting online is because I wanted to keep myself accountable. And I knew I'm like, I'll start this and I'll stop it if I'm posting. And I stopped posting. I'll have my friends say, hey, so you were like posting your workouts for a while there. What happened? And it might guilt me into doing it again. Then as I started posting, <laughs> You kind of, over years, things, my body started changing. I started being able to do more. And then people would message me and say, like, what are you doing? And I would say, well, I post, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And then I started having women's health professionals say, it's really dangerous, the information you're giving. You're being really negligent. You shouldn't share this advice. You shouldn't post yourself lifting with a diastasis and with hernias. And then I was like, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And then I felt bad. I talked to my friend about it and she said, well, I agree you shouldn't give um, advice if you have no education. So why don't you just get certifications in it? So I was like, okay, then. And that's when it kind of brought me into like looking for general personal training certifications and then basically just scouring the internet for anything related to diastasis, which was really in the postnatal fitness bundle. And so, and then the more I learned, my, the more my interest spread beyond diastasis. Yeah. It's, um, it's quite the journey that you've taken, you know, the, um, well, traveling from Nigeria to England, for example, um, you know, that post-op story, I don't think you've told me that post-op story before. Um, you know, the, the, the whole dealing with things both as, um, as a child being the only black kid in, in the town that you're in um you know all the way through to to wondering if you can carry a baby through to you know talking about uh hernias and finding out what a hernia is for the first time after your second child and that was the thing that you were dealing with all those years ago like that's that's quite the journey and and then just sharing what you're doing because your body was changing and people wanting to know more um you know it, it it's um it doesn't sound like fitness. I know that fitness is not your first profession. Um, uh, what were you doing before you decided to go into fitness and, and sharing what you've learned and um, helping to try to change the world? Um, well, I was, I've kind of just hopped around not really knowing where I fit in. Um, so I kind of realized even in fitness, just sometimes you don't fit in anywhere and it's okay to not fit in and to create your own space because I was as an immigrant child and a lot of immigrant childs can relate to it there was especially Nigerian children an, there was an expectation of what you were going to do at university it was going to be a doctor a lawyer an architect so when I went to university it was to do law but my university of choice didn't offer me law it offered me politics and so <laughs> that's what I did then when I met my husband, who was Canadian, and I moved to Canada straight out of university when I was 21. Um, and I came to Yellowknife. I had a politics degree, so I started working for the city of Yellowknife. And from then I moved to start working for the government of the Northwest Territories. 
and that's where I was for the last six years. And with that, it was that was in that period that I was going having my children and going through my own personal journey. So I was doing that as my full time job, but kind of just blogging online and talking about my own journey, which everything just kind of tied into each other. Like the whole when I talked about the body image with the diastasis, um, I could talk about about learning to be okay with it because it wasn't the only thing that I learned to be okay with. And I could understand the idea of people saying like, how can you live with a body like this? But it's kind of tied into expectations because the expectation is that you're, you shouldn't look like that. And my whole life I've been outside of the expectation. I grew up where nobody looked like me and the it, books I read and the images I saw were representing were like one image and one voice. And that was, so my expectation was should be I should look like that. And one of the things I blog about was really having an issue with my race, with being black. And when we speak about biases and prejudices, I think some people sometimes will get offended because they're like, especially in this climate, they feel like only it's suggesting that only white people have biases or only white people have prejudices. But the, I, the thing about implicit biases is that we all have it and we all hold it and we're all learning the same things and how that affects a lot of children that grow up as in a minority community British children is that you deflect you flee it onto yourself so I didn't like being black I didn't want to be black I didn't think it was beautiful but I couldn't escape it and so um I had to like change my approach I had to change the language around it and language is powerful so because I couldn't change my blackness I had to change the language around it so I started intentionally looking for black authors that wrote empowering things and watching TV where black people were pre presented in empowering ways to help me feel like I, I could feel better. And so when I started talking about diastasis, the reason I didn't want to associate, the reason I didn't want to be black is because I didn't associate blackness with beauty or all the other positive things I associated whiteness with. And the reason it offended me to the idea when someone said, do you have a diastasis? Because so many negative things were associated with that word. They were saying, you know, like, it's going to cause you, you'll have back pain, you'll have a difficult pregnancy, you'll have this, you'll have that. But then as I started exercising, I found, yes, when I initially started, I did have back pain. But six years later, I still had like, I have a six centimeter diastasis and I didn't have back pain. When I started, I had a six centimeter diastasis and I had incontinence. And then six years later, I still had a six centimeter diastasis and I didn't have incontinence. And when I was able to kind of change the language and it was like, you can have a diastasis, but it doesn't need to be a negative thing. I didn't feel ashamed of having it. And so it's like the power of presenting it is like a bad thing. And um, as the thing that defines you and it's like yes my my lens when I speak I write through the lens of a black woman and an intrinsic part of who I am but it's not the thing that defines me I'm so much more than that and you can have a diocese and it can be part of what your body is but it doesn't have to be the thing that defines you well said I was just sort of think reflecting and Emma said about um you know what you were talking about and, and the as a child, you know, feeling so different to everyone around you and looking outwardly for, for voices for people who look like you, who, um, who are, are, you know, like visually there. And, and I can imagine that's really hard when it's just, you know, I think that's something that's really important that's changed. I feel like it's very, very, very slowly changing, but at the moment it's so important that we see people of, you know, of, who are different, out on social media we we listen to people's stories we and auntie and i love listening to people's stories but i remember molly was talking about you know if you google fit woman and you press images in google have you ever done this it's, no it's, i'm sure you can imagine what you're going to see it's young white skinny women with you know very particular looks so toned but not too muscly um, and it's, it's very, very generic and on Instagram and, you know, we were talking about this with your daughter as well, weren't we, Anthony? It's just, it's that, that is, that is that stereotypical fit woman. And so I can imagine, you know, like if you are overweight, if you're a person of color, if you are disabled, you don't see yourself in any of that. So you can't see yourself as being fit or beautiful and, or even, you know, with, with the hernia or with the diastasis. You know, if we could see more images of women, because diastasis is really common. Um, and, you know, if we can see more body shapes and sizes and colors in our imagery, and I know, 
you know, we look at stock photos, even this is like, I know it's a bit of a sidestep, but just for work, you know, when you're promoting classes and you're promoting businesses and um, writing blogs and things, and you try and get stock photos. And I don't know if you've ever tried to do this, but it abs- like it does my head in because they all look the same. And I'm thinking, you know, when I'm working with new mums, I don't want the postnatal pictures to be all skinny, white, pretty, made up women with their perfect little babies coming into class because women don't see themselves in that. They're just like, you know what? I feel bloated and I'm tired and my hair's a bit of a mess and my baby's probably got food on its <laughs> like yeah, yeah. jumper or whatever. And, um, you know, we get all these, these images just thrown at us constantly, 100,000 times a day. And, you know, it can, it can kind of like just come into here and make us think, well, we're not good enough. We are not fitting into this ideal. Um, so I, I love that you said all of that because I, I think that's really important. And I think we all play a role in trying to change that narrative there and, and getting more people talking about things. And, and so we can see different people sharing their stories. And hopefully, you know, like the next generation, these children can look and say, oh, there's, that's me. You know, I can be a superhero. I can be this. I can be that. And just as much as we say, like, I mean, from... As children we say it's what's on the inside that counts but it's like ironic when you're I feel like as a trainer when dealing with a client it's learning that it's not sometimes what's on the outside draws them in but often it's how they're feeling on the inside and I spoke to like a friend and she said if you want to grow like your social media account you have to speak to a more general audience you can't be so specific you can't be so niche and I definitely understood where that was coming from but I also felt like I've never been in that general group. I've never been in the normals. <laughs> I've always felt like I'm in the sidelines. I'm like in the outcast, in the freak. So it's taken me like 34 years, but I've embraced that. And I'm like, I'm not speaking to the normals. I'm speaking to the freaks, like the outcasts, the people that no one else is speaking to. I'm speaking to the people, the unseen, because I felt invisible my whole life. So that I empathize with that. I'm like, I see you too. And the thing with that is when someone comes with the diastasis conversation, it's like when they say, I want to fix my diastasis, there's always so much more to that conversation. It's like, what does fix mean? Is it a body image issue? And for me, I can write intrinsically saying that if it's just because you don't like how it looks, like you have the option of doing other things, but it's not always like for me, it's surgery because I can tell you from experience, there's a lot of things that I didn't like about the way I looked and I couldn't fix with surgery. And I've been able to not only embrace it, but celebrate it. So there are ways, but like, like exercise, it takes time. It's progressive. It's something over years, it's progressive overload. It's practicing the same patterns until they become your new normal. So it's like, what are you trying to achieve? And the thing with that is if you focus on the invisible people, everybody else hears you too. Um, The people that don't feel seen, like I have so many women like message me and they're like, oh, like I have a hernia too. And they're so ashamed of it because like it's an embarrassing thing but because I've presented mine, it makes them feel able to reach out. And then when they reach out to me, it makes me feel more less alone. It makes me feel like less abnormal. So it's empowering to me too. But then the more I feel like this is okay. So the person, you know, that you're marketing, that that perfect body is going to make you happy. So they get the body and they're still not happy. So they look at me and they're like, well, she's so flawed. Like what's her deal? So you can kind of still draw it in because I think at the end of the day, we're, nobody's really looking to look a particular way. We're looking to feel a particular way. And that's what fitness gave me. It made me like feel differently in my body. And because my relation, the, because I felt different with my body, I spoke differently about it. Um, because I felt stronger. Like it's not even that I could change the things that I didn't like. They just became less in the forefront. When I was able to focus strength, I put my focus on strength. Then the aesthetics were in the shadows. It was still there. It's not something I'm like, oh, I absolutely love how it looks. But I can say I love how my body works. And the hernia, there's not a but with the hernia. It's not I love how my body works, but the hernia. I love how my body works, but the diastasis. It's like I love how my body works, period. I think my body is beautiful. Not I think my body is beautiful despite the hernia. And it's kind of learning to highlight the things that you want. If diastasis, when they say I want to fix my stasis, sometimes because they're in pain. So, I mean, if you could take away the pain or if you could reduce the pain or change the pain without changing the diastasis, is that something that you would want? Because maybe that's what the question that they're actually asking. So it's important to look at the story, like, why don't you want surgery? Is it because 
I, do, I think surgery is bad or I think surgery won't help or is it because there's a trauma with surgery and I don't, it's not going to help me because there's so much negative things associated with that. So maybe that's not the route for me. It doesn't mean it's not the route for someone else, but everybody, like we're human beings, nobody, your patient is not a walk in diastasis. There's so many layers beyond that. And if you just focus on the diastasis, you're never going to help her. She's not a work, walking prolapse. If the prolapse bothers her, there's, it's not just because she's been given this diagnosis. There's other layers between that. So if you, if we find what the, what they're actually looking to solve. And it's often a lot more than because their body looks a certain way. A hundred percent. And I'm a hundred percent. Um, I feel for me, I'm like, I didn't hate being black because there's anything wrong with being black. I hated being black because I didn't, my language of beauty didn't include black bodies, didn't include black people. And for my language to change, um, I had to expose myself. I had to read empowering things by black people. And I just had to follow people that were black and just loved being black and absorb that. And the voices that you listen to matter. So you have to be, in, as a postpartum woman, especially, you have to be intentional about the voices. After my second child, I did the, I'll follow all the fit spurs with the six packs because that will motivate me. But what that actually did, I look at them and I compare it with my body and I felt worse. My, after my uh, third pregnancy, I intentionally just followed new mums. I followed people that were really honest about their postpartum bodies or just voices that just lifted me up um, instead of, yeah, spoke, spoke to my soul rather than speaking to my body. Yeah, really, really important. And I love that last point. Um, you know, I wanted to like, obviously black lives matter. Um, and so for, for us and, you know, we are recording this at a time when this is very current and very going on right now. Um, how, how are you seeing what's going on in a seemingly different area? Like we're talking about social injustice, we're talking about discrimination, racism, inequality, um, in, in uh, what people of color go through, but in particular, right now, what black people are going through. Um, how does that also apply to your journey into like, I know you've talked, you've talked a little bit about it, but like, specifically, um, you know, body image and diastasis and, and the lessons and the, the dots that you can connect for what's going on right now, as well as how that systemic, um, I guess, prejudice plays into how that, um, how that went in your journey. It's hard because I know you've spoken a, a, a bit about it already. Um, yeah, tell us more, I suppose. I think when we see like now, I think people often see like the idea of racism as these big events, these big, but these big events happen because of smaller events. Like most racism is not covert. It's, it's insidious. It's like hidden under the carpets. And I feel like it's the small things that create the big things. And for me, something I've been saying for years, like representation, representation matters. And Racism is not like people are so concerned about being called racist and it becomes such a hot talking point. And the thing with racism, it's not in, it's in the action. Racism is an action. We all have vices and prejudices. Everybody holds it. But if you act on those vices and prejudices, that action becomes a racist action. And so it's important to challenge our biases at every level. And our biases are built without even knowing. And that's like the kind of information that you're getting. And for my own personal journey, it was like, I hated being black. I'm like, why, why do I feel like it's negative? But the images that the only images I was exposing myself to are like, I love old Hollywood. And so I would see the old Hollywood starlets, which it was in a different time. Like black people weren't promoted. I wrote black books. I followed only black social media accounts. Um, I was comparing my body to like white bodies. And so it was everything. I was only exposing myself to one voice. And so my bias was towards one way. And so to change my bias or to challenge it, I had to expose myself to different voices. For me, I felt like it wasn't something I could avoid. I was like, I don't like hating myself. I'm a black woman. I'm going to have to find, have a different conversation with myself. But I think now when people are thinking, how can I be more representative? Like what are the voices that you're listening to? Like if you're, 
especially in social media, social media reflects back on us what we already like. And so it's just going to show you more of what you already like. And so you do have to be intentional and say, well, what are the other voices out there saying? Um, and that's important because especially as um, a practitioner, if you, are if you are only hearing one voice, then you're going to treat everyone the same. And their situation matters. Like um, if you, like my doctor, I think of my childhood doctor. I feel like if he had an understanding that hernias are common in African children, he might not have rushed to surgery. It might have been a different conversation, but because it's not common in white children, he was like, okay, or he might have given different advice, but it's understanding that. Or I was at um, a fitness course one time and I was, one of the other trainers looked at me and said, oh, you have a lower back lordosis, you should fix that. And I'm like, there's nothing wrong with my lower back. And he's looking in, and he's looking at the picture in the thing and I'm like, it's, like that's how my mom's back looks, that's how my sister's back looks, this is like, but it's like you compare, whatever you see becomes your normal and everything outside that becomes abnormal. And so if you want your normal to be a broader range, you have to see more. For my own thing, I intentionally, with the diastasis, I had to intentionally follow a cast with people that had diastasis. And the reason, and I had to change the kinds, kinds of accounts I followed, when all the information was diastasis is, will give you all these negative stuff I didn't want to associate with myself with that I'm like well I have a diastasis and I am learning how to feel empowered with it are there other voices that will speak about diastasis in an empowering way and when the more I saw those voices the more I felt more comfortable to challenge my body in different ways the more I saw other people with diastasis weren't afraid the less I felt afraid and what was normal to me broadened so if you want a broader understanding then you have to be intentional and open yourself to more voices yeah so that's even just from that small diastasis area you know like um if people have this expectation that there should be zero gap between the two sides of your rectus um, after you give given birth, it's supposed to completely come back together it's supposed to be completely zipped up through the middle and then anything that goes outside of that is faulty wrong bad um, and I think, you know, Anthony and I have had the pleasure of working with like literally hundreds of postnatal women yeah. and that exposure to seeing so many different, so many different um, women with different abdominal wall um, uh, sort of strength, uh, linear alba thickness with softness and seeing just how capable we are and how resilient we are and what, what women can actually achieve. And, you know, yes, some women, as you said before, some women go on to have surgery and it's the absolute best option for them. Um, but I, I do think in that postnatal world, we, there's somehow this, this message that it's supposed to all come back together. And, and, and it's like, I have women come and see me in tears with like a one finger gap um, that's functionally brilliant there's you know and they're not having any symptoms but in their mind it's supposed to be there's supposed to be nothing there and and I'll often say to them you know like I, I I measured some male physios the other day and three of them had three finger gaps and then they were in their 20s and they did crossfit and were really fit and healthy you know where where's this messaging coming from um, which is something I guess again we need to start to put out a little bit more that it's probably not meant to be complete. And you know, we know that from research too. <laughs> I think like part of that is like what Anthony says is like challenge your biases, <laughs> become mm. aware of your biases and find information that's going to be completely contradictory. So if you do believe a diastasis is dysfunctional, then find out if there are people that have, that live with it and are functional. And it's the same thing with the, um, the messaging right now. A lot of people are like, Oh, you know, black people are making it a black issue or why people are talking about race. But if you want to understand, then listen to the voices that don't agree with you. Because if so many people are saying the same thing, maybe it's worth considering. And it's not like people often think that just because another truth exists, that their truth doesn't exist. It's like there's place for more than one truth. There's place for more than one reality. We only have one worldview. We're limited by our life experience. But if you want to broaden your understanding, then you have to listen to other people's um, life experiences and integrate that into yours. It doesn't mean that yours is wrong. Yours is valid, but yours isn't the only story out there. So if you yeah. want to have, if you want to speak truth, then you have to understand that there's more levels to it than just yours. And I think part of that is learning to sit with a bit of discomfort, right? Um, yeah. Because 
for some people, you know, it's like, no, it's too hard. I don't, I don't know any of this. It's not happening to me. It's got nothing to do with me. I'm not racist. I have never been racist to anybody. So therefore I, you know, all lives matter hashtag. And, yeah. um, which I was is just about is to just, raise that, you know, <laughs> yeah. which is just, it's insane. And I think, you know, we all, you know, I'm definitely like, I'm learning a lot in this space and, um, there, you know, you have to kind of, I think in, to some degree sit with a little bit of discomfort and say, and I love that you fact you've acknowledged that, you know, we all have our own biases and prejudice and we have to actually sit there and go, hang on, actually, how did I feel in that situation? And how did I react in that situation? And what am I, what am I doing actively to support um, black people to, you know, raise their voices? You know, how am I actually trying to make a difference in the world? And, um, you know, I, I think we all have to just sit back and go and listen. Like you said, just listen, follow people, read, hear about their experiences. Because the more you hear about people's experiences, you just kind of think, oh, shit, I had, excuse my language. I had no idea. I had no idea because I live in my little bubble. <laughs> I live in my little bubble where, you know, I life's pretty easy. You know, I don't, you know, no one is discriminating against me because of the colour of my skin. Um, and, yeah, it's so easy just to, trick on by and say it's not a problem but it's not a problem for me that doesn't mean that it's not a problem for hundreds of thousands of other people and but if you don't listen to those stories or actively seek them out I think it's very easy to pretend and and live in fairyland where it's you know it's it's not happening and I think in Australia there's a bit of that I don't know whether you feel that that is in Canada but we kind of look towards what's happening in America and you know even our prime minister said some stupid things this week and you know, saying, oh, America is so bad because they've got all this history of slavery and they've, this, their racism is so bad. And we sit there thinking, hang on, glass bubble, man, we've got some issues in Australia and, you know, we, we need to come back to home here and, and start thinking about how we can actually help our Indigenous society in particular because um, who have the worst health outcomes, um, you know, their life expectancy is about, is it like 15 years younger or something, Anthony? Um, yep. yep. Yeah, and the incarceration rates incarceration rates are disproportionately large so you know glass house throwing stones and all we need to look back in on ourselves and see what we can do better it's funny because i'm like the racism conversation when people say i don't see racism it's always like well you don't experience it unless you're the target of it it's like you sitting outside and me sitting inside or me being outside and it's raining and you're sitting inside and i'm like it's raining and you're sitting inside and you're like well i'm not wet it's like, well, no, of course you're not wet, but it is raining. That doesn't seem to be true. That's the thing with truth. It is both true that you're not wet, but it is also true that it is raining and I am wet. So I'm like, while it might be true that you don't see racism, it is also true that racism exists. And your ability to acknowledge this doesn't take away from like your own lived experience. But um, it was kind of like my experience here on a personal level, when I moved to Canada, I really didn't understand like Canadian politics. And I live in Yellowknife and um, this is the land of the Dene First Nation. And whenever we, um, we have a city hall assembly at the Black Lives Matter, I was a demonstration yesterday, we open it up with a prayer. The chief, Dene chief, opens up with a prayer and, he's, and we acknowledge that we're on the land of the Yellowknife's Dene. First, I didn't understand that because I'm like, like lots of Canadians live there. Everyone lives here. Can, Canada's been a country for over a hundred years. Like it's everyone's land. I'm like, why would you have to say it's the Dene people's land? And then I understood like the history, the history of, you know, colonialism, um, residential schools, what has been called by Canadian, the Canadian government, a cultural genocide. And I understood that this is a people that feels like they had a lot taken from their ancestors. They had this land taken from their ancestors. And for us to stand up today and acknowledge that this is the land of their ancestors, that means everything to them. That's powerful. That's acknowledging an injustice that was done. It cost me nothing to do that. It cost me nothing to say this is the land of the Yellow Knives Den. It takes nothing away from my experience, but it means everything to someone else's experience. So for me, I'm like, for you to say Black Lives Matter, or for you to acknowledge that racism exists even though you don't experience it, it costs you nothing. It doesn't take away from your life, it doesn't take away from your experience, but it means that you're acknowledging the experience of someone else, you're acknowledging an injustice someone else is experiencing, and it means everything to those people. So I'm like, what, is it so hard for you to just 
you know, let people to believe somebody else's experience because that's what it is, just believe their experience. And it's like, you say, oh, my friends haven't um, experienced it. My friends don't see it. And sometimes I feel like people don't understand the definition of a minority. <laughs> I'm like, no, the majority of people don't experience it because in Canada, the minority, black people are 14%, and, sorry, the USA, black people make up 14%. It is only 14% of people saying this. In Canada, it's 3%. In the U UK, it's 3%. So it's not that, this isn't happening. It's just that only the vo the people that are saying it, their voices aren't going to be heard if the majority is talking over them and saying it's not happening. And the fact that you're saying it's not happening doesn't mean that it's not happening. It just means that you're continuing to deny people justice. Yes. Yes. It's um like acknowledgement and, and from a, like, I mean, you know, simplistic and not trying to make it equivalent like it, it's it's like saying to somebody who's sitting there telling you that they have pain it's like you don't have pain yeah you don't have pain i've got bad back pain yeah you don't have bad back pain i don't have bad i can't back pain. see it i can't <laughs> I see it your scans are clear your scans are clear you don't have pain um you're making it up you're crazy you're trying to work the system you know like uh Yes, it's very frustrating. Um, there's, there's, uh, if you could speak, I know that you've just spoken about it. Okay. I do recognize it, but I want to explicitly, I want to explicitly address the, the reaction that a lot of people have, whether it's uh, public or private that, you know, all lives matter and I don't see color. Can you tell us? as as a woman who's been an immigrant twice um about uh who's black how that how you feel about those two phrases i don't see color and all lives matter in response to black lives matter can you give us a little bit more about your experience about those please uh, i don't see color i understand the intent to be like i don't treat anybody different because of color but I think there's a misunderstanding of that is equality or that is the desire of black people that they don't want you to see their color because um, it's just the idea of ignorance. It's saying that ignorance is bliss and ignorance is dangerous. If you don't see color, one, you don't see the experience of people of color and you don't see how different it is. It's like my, I think, you know, my local pharmacy doesn't see color because when I go in there, the makeup counter is only for white people. Like, I can, can't pick a foundation in my skin tone. I can't pick, often I can't find lipsticks that flatter my skin tone because they look, some bright colors just look ridiculous, I think, against my skin. I can't find um, hair products for my hair. So the people in the advertisements don't look like me, so they don't see color. And so I when you don't see color, people of color become invisible in your society. So it becomes an un unequal society. Um, all lives matter, like the sentiment on its own, yes, it's a wonderful statement. But the problem I have with it, many people have with it, is that it's not that it was just a phrase created because all lives matter. It's said as a retort to Black Lives Matter, as though, what are you saying? Black matters and just injustices against Black people matter, injustices against all people matter. And that's it's true, injustice against all people matter, but it's always context, context matters. Yes, injustices or all people matter. People like to throw the stat that more white people in the USA get killed by the police force than black people. Yeah, white people make up 86% of the population, but the stats are a funny thing because you can use it to support anything, same as in diastasis. Um, yes, more white people get killed, but they make up 84% of the population. When you bring those stats down, it actually turns out that black people are two and a half times more likely to be killed by police. And so that's when it becomes a problem because if black people are two and a half times more likely, then maybe like it's a race thing. Um, with diastasis, you get stuff like um, diastasis causes. There was one research, um, she said that her exercise program healed a diastasis and it was linked to a research that proved that her exercise healed the diastasis. What the research showed is that 26 women um, 
26 women had no change to their diastasis after doing her exercise program. So she, the, she concluded that it made it no difference. But other research shows that exercise may or may not affect a diastasis. So it's like, yes, they did her exercise program, and yes, the diastasis didn't get bigger, but would it have gotten bigger if they didn't do the exercise program? Were there other factors? Like, it's so, you can, you can manipulate it. And so, yeah, that's the thing with All Lives Matter. When All Lives Matter is a retort to Black Lives Matter, it's diminishing the plight of Black people, and then it becomes an insult, and then it becomes this idea that if you care about human rights, then you should care about Black human rights. You shouldn't feel the need to say, this isn't important because other things happen as well. I even had someone say, linked and say, well, explain to me Black Lives Matter when, and they were linking like different um, crimes, like uh, videos of black people um, destroying things during the protest or different black crimes. It was like, are you really telling me, asking me to explain to you why black, why black lives matter when black crime exists? Like, do you not understand the idea of how human rights work? Like, if you don't understand human rights, this is not a, worth, a conversation worth having. Yeah, and, you know... And just, there, just hear people's story. People say it's a part of their story. I wrote about that. It's like, people say Black Lives Matter. It's not a statement to say white lives don't matter. It's a statement to say, we live in a society where Black people feel as though they're not seen, where crimes against Black people are not prosecuted in the same way, where Black people have experienced injustice for hundreds of years, and where we feel as though our lives don't matter. And so to that, we have to say, yes, our lives do matter. Black lives matter also. That's what the statement is saying. And and that and if I feel like if you understand that, it's not an insult to anyone else. Like transgender people say trans, trans is beautiful. They're not saying trans is beautiful because psi people are ugly. They're saying trans is beautiful because for so long they've been told that transgender is not beautiful. So it's a proclamation to themselves to say trans is beautiful too. That's all that it is. <laughs> When we talk about gay rights, another thing, people, gay rights, animal rights, lots of people will happily advocate for animal rights, but not black lives. <laughs> the, black lives matter is offensive, but animal rights is good. No, what about the plants? What about the plants? Humans, in right? What about the plants? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just like, uh, yeah, <laughs> let's uh, fight against cancer. Well, what about meningitis? You don't care about meningitis? It's like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, you were going to say something. Oh, I was just going to say that um, a, lot of the, a lot of the arguments that are brought up, um, I, I, I like how, you, um, how you're basically saying it's an and, not, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a comparison, it's and. Because if all lives do matter, then it's, it's okay to say that black lives matter because at the moment, it doesn't look like it matters and that's a problem you know and so when when somebody says black lives matter oh no all lives all lives matter the diminishing experience is um is terrible is terrible yeah. and and um it's just acknowledging a specific problem um and like i loved your rain example <laughs> you know um you know, That's such a good analogy. Yeah, it doesn't change the fact that just because it's not raining on me doesn't mean that it's not raining. Uh, it does happen, and I've grown up with it. Um, it still happens from time to time, and and I do modify my behavior to try and avoid it. Um, but um, look, it's uh, it's important to also recognize that people who are using these types of arguments back for example black lives matter let me show you video of crimes of uh black people committing crimes therefore like is that is that an argument against the fact that oh because black because some black people commit crimes therefore black lives don't matter it's like that's a nonsensical argument do you know what i mean um yeah. it's just a silly <laughs> argument uh, i found uh, the alt-right playbook series on youtube was was an interesting video series to watch because it doesn't just deal with race it deals with all sorts of things um so you know the tactics that people will use to argue and to um i found that that was a an interesting resource um 
look, we're coming to the end of our time. We can talk for for ages, and I know that you have so much to to say, and and what you do have to say is so important. And um, and I love reading your stuff on social media when I when I get to see it. Um, is there any if you had to summarize our conversation in the past hour, how would you summarize it, and what would you want people, anybody who's listening, um, to take away from this? To, to think about, to consider, and, you know, we've talked about um, diastasis, we've talked about hernias, we've talked about trauma from childhood surgery experiences, we've talked about growing up as the only black kid in a very white city, uh, we've talked about being an immigrant twice, um, we've talked about uh, experiences, we've talked about Black Lives Matter, um, you know, we've covered quite a few different things and not particularly deeply. I want to acknowledge that there's tons of stuff that we can go deeply into, but I uh, would just love to hear some of, uh, you know, your main messages out there for people from this conversation. Just that there's power in your language and to listen to other people's stories. Um, it's not about being right or wrong. It's just about understanding different worldviews. Um, I think uh, you, you had said something about um what was it now i lost my train of thought <laughs> um okay I have to you by repeating the question as you were saying and i thought of something and now my head has gone blank <laughs> so your main messages because we've covered many different aspects diastasis self-image uh sorry body image oh yeah now i remember because you were saying pay clients um, the clients will give you your answers. And I think it goes for all aspects of life. If you are interested in helping somebody, then hear their story. And if someone comes to you, for like for whatever reason, whatever field that they're in, because they're in pain or they don't like their body or they want to do something else, if you hear them out, they'll tell you what you need from them. And it goes the same with the Black Lives Matter conversation. And like, it's fine if you don't want to help, like nobody is advised to help, but if you're interested in having the conversation and making a difference and you don't know where to begin or where to start, just listen, listen to people's stories because people will tell you exactly what they want. Like black people are saying, we just want you to advocate for, for us. We just recognize that we're a minority and we're not being heard and we're looking for advocates to amplify. Your client can tell you, will tell you what they want. They might come in and say, I have a diastasis, what can I fix it? Have a conversation. What does fix mean to them? What, what does healed mean to them? I don't like how my belly looks. Why don't you like how your belly looks? If you had an experience, a different experience in your body, um, would it affect how you saw yourself? Like it's conversations, our whole, we make a difference by talking to people, by hearing people's stories. Um, I just want to leave with Maya Angelou, who's like my favorite author of all time. She said, um, there is no greater agony than an untold story. So hear people's stories. What a great, what a great summary there. And it sounds, um, and Emma said, like you have, you really, when you're working with your clients, you really come from that place of curiosity and just being really like open in asking questions and wanting to just dive a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. So there's really open-ended questions and exploring where some of those beliefs, where those, some of those thoughts have come from. And I think that's really important because, you know, and us as health professionals, you know, we ha we can come from that, you know, fix it mindset where we just want to come in. This is a problem. This is the solution. And it's a, uh, it's taken, it's only taken a couple of decades to move past that for me. Um, but no, no, that's not quite right. But you know, like I think the, in order to help our clients, we really need to understand their story so much better. And I think that's, I think that's a fantastic summary. Um, so what we've, Anthony's asked me to wrap up and I think you almost wrapped up a minute ago, Anthony, but through this last hour, which has been so fantastic. So thank you very much for your time. So we've heard about your story and Emma said of sort of the coming, having this journey as a child, um, having these hernias, which lots of people in your family had, which for a lot of children, they just grow out of um, African children, but growing up in this uh, town in England um, where it's very, very white, the doctor didn't really understand this straight to surgery. You had this quite traumatic experience associated with that surgery and the recovery process and never really understood 
why the surgery was done or what hernias were. And then, you know, fast forward years later, um, there are these, you know, issues with your body image where you never really felt like your tummy looked right or felt right. And there was the bullying from childhood too. And then after your second baby, that was when you started having diastasis and thinking, all right, my tummy's not looking right. I must be overweight, got to lose the weight, smashed it, lost lots and lots and lots of weight. And you're already quite thin, still had this little belly, Google diastasis, and then thought, ah, okay, this is the thing. How am I going to, how am I going to fix it? But then having this whole journey of really understanding yourself and your body and realizing that actually that can be a part of you that you don't have to dislike or hate that, you know, lots of people have hernias and, and diastasis and it's, it's a part of your story and it's part of your, your beauty really. And it's a part of, it's part of who you are and that you don't necessarily wanted to rush down that surgery um, road, especially given your past history. And you've been working for quite a while with women online sharing your experiences and helping other women come to realize that there's not this one body that we're all aiming to get is actually many different ways a body, a body can look and can function. And it's kind of, I guess, turning that, turning that torch inwards a little bit on our own sense of self image and self worth and all these other factors. And then we've gone, we've talked quite a bit about um, the black lives matter movement. Um, and hopefully it is a movement that we, it's not, it's not a moment in time. This is something that is going to continue for hopefully um, for, for years and years to come until we can actually get some, get some change. But you talked about how people can actually, how we can all learn more from listening and from actively seeking voices that are different to our own and as health and fitness professionals too. Um, because we, if we want to work with people from different cultures, different genders, different sexualities, you know, we actually need to listen to those voices. Otherwise, we're going to put our cookie cutter approach onto how we work with people and we put all our own biases and thoughts onto this without actually really understanding the human experience. Um, is that, have we, if I summarize oh, that? Yeah, absolutely. Relatively um, well. Um, no, so, <laughs> and Emerson, if you have any closing remarks that you would like to um, share with our audience, that would be amazing. And especially how we can learn more about you and what you do and how people can follow you. I think that would be amazing. Um, that's, I think you covered everything. I'm on social media. I'm on Instagram at mummy underscore fitness. It's spelled M-U-M-M-Y. So I did my schooling in British, so I spell mummy with a U and not an O. Um, same on Facebook, mummy fitness on Facebook. Fantastic. Um, well worth following your stuff on Instagram. Uh, love, love how thoughtful you are and the information you present and um the messaging that goes into it really really enjoy it um and you know i try to share it whenever i see it um so it's great keep up the good work there uh and if you do want to work with a nemesis if you want to chat with a nemesis um, we'll make sure that all the information is in the notes um in the show notes wherever you listen to it if you enjoyed this episode press like subscribe share it um and yeah, thank you very much, Anemisit. Thank you, Marika. It's always uh, a good chat, and um, we'll chat to you soon. And if you have any questions that you do want to ask Anemisit, please uh, leave it on the Facebook page, on the website, um, or via email, and we'll make sure that Anemisit gets it to uh, gets to see it. And um, you know, the the usual end of show type of stuff is coming up now. Thanks. Well, that's it for this episode. Be sure to hit like if you enjoyed the episode and leave any comments or questions below. We'd really like to hear from you. If you haven't already hit subscribe, please do so now so that you can be kept notified when we release our next episode. Otherwise, thank you for listening and we look forward to having you back with us for another episode of the Women's Health Podcast.